Hey everyone and welcome back to another edition of the Data Idols and Data Science Festival Summer School. I'm Jess, the Community Director at the Data Science Festival and your host for this last of a three-part mini-series of Intro to Machine Learning. Today we're going to cover clustering with the lovely people at Compass Lexicon. There is two more in this little mini-series, which is regression and classification. So if you have time to watch those on playback, or if you've already watched them, congratulations, and hopefully we'll see you there so you can get all three parts all together. So in a minute in the chat, you'll see there'll be an invite to our Slack channel. Please join if you haven't already done so. Um, there's lots of opportunities to chat with us, to chat with other attendees, um, and just network even though we're behind our laptops. So that'll be in the chat very soon. So just wanted to say thank you again to all our summer school partners. All these companies have been integral in making this summer school a reality. They've given up their time, they've recorded everything, and now they're offering it to you guys completely free. So we are incredibly grateful to every single one of our partners who have helped to make the summer school a reality. So this session is run by the love people, as I've said, as uh, from Compass Lexicon. They're one of our partners this year, and Rashid and Ethan are going to take us through clustering. So hope you enjoy and see you at the next event. Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to another Data Science Festival Summer School session. Um, Today we'll be talking about uh, clustering. So this is the third in a series of introduction to machine learning talks. Um, and this will be presented by myself and my colleague, Ethan Sue. So we are both uh, data scientists at Compass Lexicon. Um, I lead the data science team. I originally started my career in economics and have progressively been drawn into the data science world. Um, I spent a bit of time at Deliveroo and have since joined um, CompSelectCon to spin up the data science team and uh, um, apply the techniques from the data science world, including clustering, to the various um, interesting challenges that we face in computation policy and economics. Um, Ethan is on my team. He um, has an academic background in operations research. Um, focus very much around how do we apply scientific and data-based decision making um, to make better decisions. Uh, he has various jobs previously, including one at FDI Consulting, um, and has been with us um, for the broad part of the existence of the data science team. And so we're very much looking forward to um, this opportunity to speak to all of you uh, today. Um, just a quick rundown on how today is going to go. Um, I already mentioned who we are. I'm going to very briefly mention who Compass Lexicon is because it's probably not a household name in the data science world. Um, we'll then give a little bit of an overview of uh, before diving straight into clustering, you know, what is unsupervised learning? What is this kind of area in which we're talking about? Um, where does it all fit in? Um, before going into a deep dive into one particular type of clustering method uh, that Ethan is going to talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, so just some background on Compass Lexicon. Um, we are an economic consulting firm. What that means in practice is uh, we advise private sector clients, uh, law firms, government clients on issues related to competition policy, litigation, uh, international arbitration um, across a wide range of industries. So what in practice what that means is uh, we take our client problems and we apply economic theory, we apply empirical analysis, and we apply data science techniques to support them in whatever regulatory or policy proceeding that they might be going through. Um, it might sound a little bit opaque, uh, and even though you might not have heard of us, we have worked on a lot of very big name uh, projects. So we worked on, for example, mergers between Google and Fitbit. We've worked on um, mergers uh, for example, uh, FCA Peugeot, um, Bayer Monsanto. So all of these various kind of very big household name cases, we work with the clients directly in order to help them understand their data in order to make as compelling an argument as possible or as compelling an analysis as possible. Uh, we're based all over Europe and we're about 500 
uh, almost 500 people now um, uh, in Europe. Um, and I suppose, uh, as perhaps a lot of people here, uh, we are also hiring. So if you do uh, uh, take some interest in applying these techniques in our um, industry, then please do check out our website or get in touch with one of us. Okay, enough of the blurb. Uh, let's jump into the substance. Um, so what is unsupervised learning? Uh, before we go into that, I think it's useful to first frame what is supervised learning. In most machine learning applications, that's what we're typically talking about. So we have some data. Um, here I kind of show it as, you know, as some generic matrix of observations. You have, you know, N observations, you have K features. You take those features and you run it through some math, you run it through some linear algebra um, to try and make a prediction about some sort of response. And that response is data that we observe in the real life. So, you know, um, what is the educational outcome of someone based on um, their parents' education level? Or uh, what is the predicted purchase of a customer based on their previous purchase? So we have some data about those people. We have some data about the things that we're studying. We have some data about what they do. And we essentially try to develop a model to understand that relationship between um, these features x and the response y. So we're essentially learning this function f of x. What is the relationship between x and y? Um, and then once we learn that relationship, we can ask a lot of interesting questions about it. So you know, given some value of x, given some unseen uh, observation, what would the outcome be? So a prediction type of task. We might also be interested in tasks such as inference. So we observe some statistics. Um, we observe some, some data, you know, what does that tell us about the real relationship? So if we, for example, want to learn about the heights of everyone in, in the UK, you know, we won't measure everyone, we'll measure some subset and then try to infer how certain we can be about the population as a whole. Um, by contrast with unsupervised learning, we only have this left-hand side bit. We only have these features X, or maybe we just don't care about the, the outcome Y. And instead of, the t instead of a task, the task being one where we try to learn about the functional relationship between some input and some output, what we're instead wanting to learn about is more about this matrix X, more about this data. So we want to understand something, uh, we want to learn some information about that. So we want to discover some structure, we want to understand um, the innate relationship between variables, the relationship between observations. And quite a lot of the time, what that comes down to is actually simplifying that data. So we might, for example, you know, have billions of observations and you know, thousands of features. But in fact, and that's too much for you as a person to visualize, to understand very easily. So a lot of unsupervised learning is about really condensing that into some kind of more simple, more understandable thing. And it's surprisingly everywhere. Um, I kind of just threw here a scatter of some of the applications that we often you will use on supervised learning for. Um, clustering, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, you might use that, for example, to segment customers. I might have, for example, um, high income, high purchase customers, high income, low purchase customers, so on and so forth, various characteristics about them. Um, I might use clustering. Something we use in our work a lot is to try and understand you know, what are the separate markets? Um, so separating, for example, geographic market, geographic boundaries by where the clusters of customers are. Um, unsupervised learning comes up a lot in recommendation systems. So if um, we might observe different patterns of purchase behavior by customers and we might say, hey, this person has liked the same movie as all of these other people, maybe they'll also like some similar movies. So these are techniques um, called matrix factorization, which can, which are also a type of unsupervised learning. Um, dimensionality reduction, another very uh, useful aspect, uh, very useful subset of um, unsupervised learning. So taking our data set, which might have you know hundreds or thousands of features, and shrinking it in such a way that we still retain as much information as possible. Um, 
but in doing so, create something that's more manageable to work with, create something that's easier to visualize and understand. Um, and you have techniques, for example, such as principal components analysis, which lets us do that. Um, and then sort of spanning all of these various areas, we also have natural language processing where um, a lot of the development has come through essentially unsupervised learning, which is passing our models lots and lots of text data, whereby you know we don't have someone labeling all of these data, all of these observations as being, you know, having a certain grammar or so on, um, but rather the, the models can actually just learn from that data, learn the structures embedded in these words and in these sentences. Um, so it's very exciting. There's loads of applications. Um, uh, and it's actually a little bit more varied than probably supervised learning is, where, where the tasks tend to be a little bit more, more precisely defined, which I guess makes it both good and bad. Um, so today we're specifically going to be talking about clustering. Um, and clustering in itself uh, is pretty self-explanatory. What we want to do, we have a bunch of data. We want to just find some subgroups of observations in that data set. And we want to do that in such a way that observations that are close to each other or that are similar in some sense, and that sense will be defined more precisely, um, are in the same cluster. And those that are far apart are in different clusters. <clears throat> um, that's a little bit vague, but here are some examples. So one might be market segmentation, which I mentioned earlier. We might observe, for example, the income of a household, um, what the or the occupation of the household members, the location, and so on. Uh, and we might want to kind of put these into different groups. Obviously, there's going to be you know an, a whole spectrum of different categories, but there might be some logical groupings, like I mentioned earlier, maybe high income, medium, low. For each of those, there might be, say, um, professionals, there might be, for example, students, and so on. And kind of getting a sense of these groupings but doing so statistically rather than eyeballing it and saying hmm, maybe we should think about uh, how to split these things can be very powerful um, because then we can then use that to then um, make decisions for example what type of marketing should we apply to these different groups <clears throat> um, one application that we've done uh, at compass lexicon for example with unsupervised learning or with clustering rather is a uh, patent analysis so we observe for example the abstracts of the patent. So each patent will say, hey, this patent is doing so and so, it re is relevant to this technology. But obviously, there's a whole range, you know, these things are not distinct. So instead, we could say, okay, which of these are quite similar together and which are quite far apart? Let's put these into groupings and then try to make sense of these groupings, um, which we can then again use for follow on analysis, we can use it to really visualize what the network of patent citations looks like, and so on. Um, and a final kind of example here is geographical analysis. So uh, one thing that we actually find in a lot of analysis, whether it's kind of us looking at competition in a market or whether you're a company and you're trying to define, you know, what should my service area be, um, especially in a country like the UK, uh, where, you know, you could probably not very well define, say, what the end of London is. Um, using things like municipal boundaries aren't actually that useful because, you know, even though in theory London might end, you still might have tons of town left. Um, if we, for example, use clustering on a population or on a household basis, we can actually start drawing much more natural boundaries around geographic markets and use that to then um, inform our decision making or use that to decide, you know, where's the next city in which we must launch or, um, where should we consider the boundaries of competition to be, uh, depending on whatever your use case might be. Um, so clustering is quite cool and it's a very powerful tool and it's actually very satisfyingly simple a lot of the times. Um, there are lots of different ways to do it. So this is from the scikit-learn documentation about the different types of cluster approaches. So um, each column here is a type of clustering and each row uh, is a basically a different data set to which that clustering is applied. Um, and we can see here, you know, um, how the different algorithms will treat differently shaped data sets. So we see, for example, that some date, some clustering approaches are very good at dealing with circles that are separate, uh, others less so. 
Um, some are very good at finding individual little groupings. Some manage to deal with outliers and so on. Um, and obviously there's a lot of, this is kind of already alluding to the fact that there's a lot of decision-making to be done when you choose which algorithm to use. And then once you decide which algorithm to use, there's a lot of decisions to be made within that algorithm in order to get um, essentially to, to get it to result in the groupings that are the most useful for your particular use case. Uh, we aren't going to go and list every single one of these and what they do because that would be boring. Um, but what instead I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Ethan, who's going to do a deep dive into k-means clustering, uh, some of the considerations, techniques, and so on. Um, and then hopefully that what that'll do is provide you all with enough of a toolkit of the theoretical considerations, the practical considerations that you can then go on and super easily read up the documentation in any other one of these um, and then and then run away with it and figure out what works best for your use case. Um, so at this point, I will stop talking and uh, we can go into some of the good stuff. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Ethan. And uh, yeah, like Rashid mentioned, I'm going to continue to share about K-means clustering. So thanks Rashid for the introduction. For K-means clustering, let's say if we are given a data set and if we want to, cl uh, to cluster this data point, if we see, if we see from the slide, um, this uh, scatter plot has 14 points, how are we going to identify subgroups, uh, which Rashid Rashi mentioned earlier. What are some of the questions that you might ask before you um, proceed with the clustering? I think the first one would be, how many clusters should I set? Should this be one, three, um, five, or even more? Another question you might ask is, which cluster should each data point be in? Or even does it make sense to have X numbers of clusters? So if we take a look at, this, at the scatter plot, if we decide to choose three clusters, does that sound right? Or do we need to uh, make some modification? And how can we check the arithmetic accuracy of the numbers of clusters chosen? Because in this case, it might seem that um, we can cluster these data points into three subgroup, but um, yeah, we don't want to base that just on our feelings or yeah, because this can be subjective. We want to back it up with some um, calculations that we do. Now, let me show you um, two different scatter plots which have been um, clustered by, by two different individuals. If you see this, the um, clustering on the right, there are two more blue points than the one on the left. So if two different individuals are to do their own clustering, they'll definitely feel that the way that they, they did the, the clustering is the better one. So if that happens, how do we justify or quantify um, which is the better classification of oh, sorry clustering um, chart that we should use? In order to do this, we have to follow a set of rules and I can tell you that it is not too difficult because all we need to do um, in, in order to group the different data points, we just need to do five steps. For this example, we are going to use these 14 points that we have seen earlier. And the first step is to choose the number of clusters K. In this case, um, for this example, I'm going to choose three. But if you decide to choose four or five because that seems um, right, that is fine as well. But for this example, I'm going to choose three. And with that, I have step one done. I'm then going to move on to step two, which is to select at random key points the centroid. Over here, I've, um, I've created three centroids, and they are the one in um, gray, orange, and blue. These centroids do not have to be for my data set. So if you can see, let me um, turn on the laser pointer. I've created um, these three centroids along the y-axis value equals to five. What you can do also is you can randomly put the uh, three centroids, perhaps the gray one here, um, the, the orange one here, and even the blue one near the zero, zero axis. And with that, we have step two done. The next step, step three, 
is then to assign each data point to the closest centroid. So if we are to assign the data points, we can see that the first five uh, data points have been assigned to the gray centroid. Um, the next five has been assigned to uh, the orange one because they are closest to the orange centroid and the last four to the blue centroid. And that and so and so quickly we have step three done already. And let's move on to step four. So step four, what we need to do here is compute and place the new centroid of each cluster. Um, what you see, what you have noticed is that the centroids now have moved slightly. slightly. Just now, um, I've placed my centroids all along the y-axis value equals to five, but now the blue centroid has moved up because um. There are more data points which are in the top half of the chart. Um, the, the orange centroid has moved down similarly because there are more points at the bottom half of the chart. And that has happened for that, that has also happened for the gray centroid. And now we go to the last step, step five, which is to reassign each data point to the new closest centroid. Let me quickly go back to um, the, scatter, the scatter plot in point four and, yeah, and see what has changed. Now, moving from step four to step five, we can see that this point has changed from orange to gray, and this point has changed from blue to orange. This is because as um, we reassign the centroids, um, yeah, sorry, uh, yeah. As we move the centroids, we are we reassign the data points that are closest to the centroids, and now this this point which used to be blue is now closest to the orange centroid, and this point which used to be orange is now closer to the gray one. If any reassignment um, in the data points took place, we go back to step four. So since these two points has changed on um, color, um, yeah, let's go back to step four. So we can see that this is a quite a uh, iterative process and we keep doing step four and step five. Um, if um, the centroids has moved and also if the data points has been reassigned. So now we see the blue centroid has moved higher, the, the gray centroid has moved higher as well, and the orange centroid has remained somewhere um, similar to its position just now. We move on to step five, which is to then um, reassign new data points. So what has changed now is that, let me go back to step four again, is that these two points, these two gray points has now changed to orange because they are now closer to um, the, the orange centroid rather than the gray centroid because the gray centroid has moved up. Again, because reassignment of data points took place, we go back to step four. All right, I'm going to go through a bit more, uh, a bit more quickly because yeah, we are just going through step four and step five again. We uh, place the centroid um, in the middle of the data points. We go to step five. And in this case, we uh, notice that one point has changed to orange. So we have to go back to step four. Again, the centroid has moved, but the blue centroid has stayed in its position because there are no data points that has changed for um, the blue clusters. And now we go to step five. After assigning um, the new centroids, we see that there are no reassignment of data points. And this is how um, we can tell that the grouping of the data points has been done. And over here, we have created our three different clusters. The one in orange, which is at the bottom, um, the one in gray at top left, and also the one in blue on the top right. So this is how we um, group our data points. As I continue to talk about clustering, uh, in fact, um, this applies to the different clustering techniques. Different clustering techniques uses different uh, measure of distance. In um, statistics or in machine learning, I, I believe you have heard of um, measure of distance like the Manhattan distance, the cosine distance, or uh, even the um, jacquard distance, which used to uh, measure um, unions and intersect. So for k-means clustering, 
k-means k uses Euclidean distance because in the first point over here, k-means is implicitly based on pairwise Euclidean distance. Um, yeah, what this means is that the sum of the um, squared deviation from centroid is equal to the sum of a pairwise squared Euclidean distance divided by the number of points. Okay, that is a bit technical. Let's go on to the second point. And later on, the, the chart, so we, uh, so we help us understand the, the, distance, the, the measure of distance a bit better. In the second point, the term centroid is itself from a, uh, an Euclidean geometry. So what it is, it is a um, multivariate mean in the Euclidean space. So um, what this also means is that if we try to um, find non-Euclidean non distance, this will generally not span um, Euclidean space. And that is why k-means only works for Euclid Euclidean distance. Um, if we are to actually calculate the distance between two points, over here we have two points, um, x1, y1, and x1, sorry, x2, y2. So when we talk about distance, this in fact is the distance between the two points. And this might look um, familiar to you because this is, um, is actually a Pythagoras theorem. In order to find the distance d, we use x2 minus x1 square plus y2 minus y1 square, and then we square root the whole value. The next point that I want to talk about is um, some of the caveats and pitfalls that we might um, face when using k-means clustering. But the first one, if we use data in an unnormalized or unstandardized form, we might face some issues. Now, let me explain further. If we try to um, cluster uh, people or, or different individuals based on um, weights and height, we can see that, <clears throat> let's say if I have an, a sample of 100 people, um, the, uh, the, the weight would probably range from uh, 50 to 100 kg. So this value is 50 to 100. And yeah, this is, yeah, so the, the difference is 50. If we look at the height for the whole population, um, the height for a population generally lies between, let's say 1.5 meters to two meters. If we look at the difference in height from the minimum to maximum, the uh, unit of measure is only 0 0.5. Whereas if we look at weight, um, the unit of measure is, um, if it's in kg, this would be in 50. So imagine if you try to plot this um, data set across a, a scatter plot, we can see that um, the, weight, the weight will move a little bit um, in absolute value. Sorry, sorry. The height, the height will move a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I apologize. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of um, columns to, to think about. Yeah, but the weight would move drastically. In, uh, in such cases, because the data is not normalized, we aren't able to capture um, the scatter of the, um, the points very nicely, and that is why um, it is very important to standardize or normalize the data set when we try to do k-means clustering. Another, um, another issue that we might face is the random in initialization trap. As discussed earlier, um, when we need to um, group the data into their clusters, we need to set um, centroids at its random place. So imagine if I set a, a blue centroid somewhere here, an orange centroid somewhere here, and a gray centroid somewhere here, it could um, result in a clustering of uh, what we see um, as, as shown in this chart, which is slightly different from what we have just now. But do not worry, if we want to um, negate this random initial initialization trap, what we need to do is just uh, make sure when we try to make sure when we code this in Python or R in, or in whichever software that you use, we need to tell them that um, to take this into um, into account so that this won't happen. Okay, now I'm going to talk a bit more about how can we determine the number of clusters. 
For the data set we have used just now, there are only 14 points. And we can, and using our, <coughs> our <coughs> eyeballing technique, we can see that there perhaps could be three clusters. What if we are given a data set of um, tens of thousands of data points? I think eyeballing would be um, much more difficult. And um, that is why we need to yeah, use um, some stronger techniques or, or methods to help us identify the number of clusters. Today, I'm, I'm going to share with you three different types of methods, the elbow method, average silhouette method, as well as the gap statistic method. You will notice that um, there are many other different k-means clustering um, techniques um, than the, the three that I'm going to discuss, but I'm just going to discuss these three because um, yeah, these three um, methods are the, the, the more widely or more commonly used ones. For the direct method, what we want to do is optimize a criterion. And for the second point, the statistical testing method, what we want to do is um, compare evidence against null hypothesis. Without further ado, let me jump straight into the first method, the elbow method. As mentioned earlier, the direct, in, in the direct method, what we are trying to do is to optimize a criterion. In this case, what we want to do is uh, minimize the total intra-cluster variation. The um, total intra-cluster variation um, can also be seen as the within classes sum of square. And, uh, and this WCSS, within classes sum of square, measures the compactness of the clustering. Rashid mentioned just now, if we are to group our clusters well, we want the um, data points in the same group to be close together, and we want the data points from other groups to be far apart so that they are distinct. In order to calculate the WCSS, which is the criterion, we can take a look at the formula over here. Let me try and um, use a chart to better visualize this. So what we want to do in order to calculate the WCSS, we want to find the distance of um, data point in each cluster to the central cluster, to the cent, uh, class, cluster centroid. So the distance squared for each data point in each cluster. So if we, in this case, if we only have one cluster, we what we need to do in order to find the WCSS would be to find the sum of squared distance for all these lines over here, which is the distance from the data point to the cluster centroid. And if I sum all this value up, I will get um, a value of 181. So now let me go to um, explain the steps that we, that we need to do to find um, the optimal number of clusters. Um, the first step would be to compute clustering algorithms for difference value of k. In general, in, in general, we normally use k values ranging from 1 to 10. Um, it is possible if you use k values which, which are larger than 10, but in doing so, and at the end of the day, if we do choose or if we proceed with a cluster of more than 10, we will need to uh, manually label um, each of these clusters, clusters which uh, might prove to be a bit um, difficult. And that is why um, a good general rule of thumb would be to use um, one to 10 clusters when we try to do the computation. As seen over here, we have calculated the WCSS when, the, when K takes the value of one. So what if I go on to calculate the WCSS when K equals to two, three, four, and so on, up to 10? Over here, I have a chart, um, and which is the same clustering which we produced just now. Again, if we try to calculate the WCSS, which is the distance from each data point to the cluster cent centroid for each of the cluster, um, we will get a WCSS value of 50. One point to take note is that as the number of um, 
or should I say the, as the value of K increases, the WCSS should um, go down. This is because as the number of cluster centroids increase, the distance between each data point to a cluster should be smaller. So let us quickly compare um, the, the chart where k equals to one. We see that these few points go into all this um, to, to this cluster centroid, but with more cluster centroid, we have a shorter distance for each data point. And that is why WCSS should go down as we in increase the value of k. Now, <clears throat> the next step, what I want to do is plot the curve of WCSS according to the number of clusters. Yes, now we have done, we, or we have calculated the value of WCSS for k equals to one, which is um, 181, and also um, where k equals to 350. So this, us, this gives us um, uh, a line, and it's, it's called the elbow method because it, if this is your arm, this probably would be your elbow, and sorry, this, if this is your, yeah, this is your forearm and this is your arm. Yeah. Um, in order to use the elbow method, what to identify the number of cluster, what we want to do is to find the location of the band in the plot, which is generally considered um, yeah, as the indicator of the appropriate number of clusters. So over here we, we see that the band is somewhere um, in when k takes takes the value three. You can also see this as um, the inflection point. Yeah. So yeah, that's great. We because using the elbow method, we identify that perhaps the number of classes that we should use is three. Now I'm going to go on to talk about um, the average silhouette method, which is the second direct method. Again, um, for the direct method, what we want to do is to um, optimize the criterion. And in this case, what we want to do is to optimize the um, average silhouette value. So the average silhouette method co computes the average silhouette of observations for different values of k. Right, this, yeah, this is very worthy, but if we want to go ahead to calculate the average silhouette value, let me show you how this is done. And keep in mind, in this case, we want to find the maximum average silhouette value compared to the elbow method, where we are trying to find WCSS, which um, minimizes the value. The first step again, um, in order to determine the number of clusters for this method, um, first step is sim similar to the elbow method, and that is to um, compute clustering algorithm for different values of k. And in this case, I'm going to use k where the values take 1 to 10 as well. Then for each k, I need to calculate the average silhouette value. The average, the calculation of the average silhouette value is not as straightforward as WCSS. So let me explain how this can be done. Assuming I set k equals to three, I now want to find the average silhouette value. How do I find this? In order to find this value, we need to find the silhouette coefficient of each point i. So what does this mean? This means that for each of the point in my data set, for these 14 points, I would need to find um, the individual silhouette coefficient first. And this silhouette coefficient is SI. How can I find SI then? I'll need to do or undertake a few calculations in order to calculate SI. The first one is to calculate AI. And AI equals to the average distance of I to the other points in the same cluster. So assuming I'm going to calculate the silhouette coefficient for this point, AI or the average distance of I to the other points would be the average of these two dotted lines. With that in hand, I then go on to calculate BI, which is the average distance to the next nearest cluster. Assuming the next nearest cluster is the, the, the gray cluster, in order to find the average distance, 
I would just need to um, find the average value of these three dotted lines over here. Again, uh, keep in mind that we are still using Euclidean distance. With AI and BI in hand, I then can calculate the co this silhouette coefficient. And the silhouette coefficient is calculated using BI minus AI divided by the larger value of BI and AI. And in this case, the silhouette coefficient for this single point is 0 0.83. Let me dive in a little bit deeper on silhouette coefficient. Remember, up to now, we have only found silhouette coefficient 0, let me see, 0 0.83, which is over here. We have not found the average silhouette value which we are interested in. However, the, um, the average of all the silhouette value, sorry, the average of all the silhouette coefficient of all the 14 points would give me the silhouette value. But let me talk a little bit more about silhouette coefficient before I, I go to the, silhouette, the average silhouette value. Um, if my data set is well, um, well clustered, again, I want the average distance of i to the other points to be very close because in, in, in this way, I know that they are well defined and for bi, I want them to be far away because, um, yeah, because when this happens, I, or should I say this shows me that um, the other clusters are far away and we can, if we have a new point introduced, we know where to put them. So assuming we have a well um, clustered data, we have a large value bi and we have a small and a small value ai. Let me put some values over here. So say B, if bi is 100 and if ai is 1, bi minus ai would be 99. And then we divide 99 by the larger value of bi and ai. So if we have two values, 100 and 1, the larger value would be 100. So if I am to calculate the silhouette coefficient, fi, si, sorry, I will have 99 divided by 100, which is 0 0.99. And that is why for a good silhouette coefficient, we take the, the value that is near to one. Conversely, if we have a bad um, silhouette coefficient, we have a value of negative one. And that is how we get um, each silhouette coefficient and the average of this will get the average silhouette value which is what we are trying to find in the first place. Now, remember, we have only done, or we have only calculated the average silhouette value where k equals to three. We need to calculate the average silhouette value for all the remaining um, k that we have set over here, which is one to 10. If I am to calculate the average silhouette value for the different values of k, going to point number three, Plotting the curves of average silhouette value according to the number of clay clusters, we will get this chart. As mentioned earlier, for this method, what we are trying to do is to maximize the um, average silhouette value. Because, yeah, because we, we have seen that a high silhouette coefficient is, is good. And this means that the um, clustering has, has been done well. So, over here, we get a value of three, which is the highest um, clustering value. And yeah, the location of the maximum is considered as the appropriate number of clusters. So over here, we have, uh, we can see again, we get, the, or should I say the optimal number of clusters over here should be three, which is same as the um, elbow method. I hope that is not too confusing. Yeah, so average silhouette method is um, a bit uh, more, or at least has a bit more steps. Now we have looked at the direct method. Let us look at the statistical testing method, which is the gap statistic method. 
for the gap statistic method, this method is um, a more sophisticated method to deal with data that has a distribution with no obvious clustering. So say for example, if you are given a data set, which, um, yeah, which might be well spread out, so you can't really um, identi identify clusters within them. A gap statistic method might be useful. If we are to use this method, again, what we need to do is as follows. The first one, cluster the observed data and calculate the um, WCSS for each K in the, uh, for each K in the cluster. So what this means is that, say if our data set has 100 points, we need to calculate um, the WCSS for all this for all this number of points. For this example, let us assume that we have just a data set of um, 10 data points. Let us put aside um, the, the previous chart we've seen just now. The next, let me just go to another chart. Okay. So after point one is done, and assuming that for, for this, for this um, data set, we only have 10 data points, we need to calculate the WCSS for all 10 points. For point two, we then generate the reference data set with a random uniform distribution. What this means is that we are going to introduce some random uniform um, data set into the initial 10 data points that we have. And with this additional data points, we then again find the WCSS. And in this case, for, for point number two, we have the green line, which is slightly above the blue line. Do remember that as the number of points increase, the WCSS will also increase. This is because um, when we calculate WCSS, there are more data points that go to the, the central, the, the center, uh, the clustered central, sorry. And yeah, and that is how we form the two lines. With these two lines, we are able to calculate the gap, the um, estimated gap statistic. What is the, um, the estimated gap statistic then? In order to calculate this gap statistic, what we are trying to do is calculate the difference in this gap for each k value, and also, um, yeah, and also the um, the this the standard deviation. So let me show you the chart. Over here, if k equals to one, we have um, a gap, uh, a small gap. And as we increase the k value, we can see that the gap increases. And as the number of k goes up, the um, gap value goes down. These are tails, these are the, the confidence interval. So the up, upper tail and the lower tail. Because as we calculate the gap statistics, we are essentially calculating the, conf the confidence interval. And with the confidence interval, we then can choose the number of clusters based on the smallest k, such that the, the gap statistic is within one standard deviation. Again, these are upper and lower tails for the confidence interval. So we do not actually have the standard deviation yet. But, we, but if we do this um, on our software, we can calculate this um, standard deviation really quickly. And you can't actually see the standard deviation value, but if you are to calculate them, the number of clusters would be four. Yeah, I, I hope this um, is clear so far. So far we have talked about how we can group the data what are some of the things that we need to take note of when we use k-means clustering? And also, we have also gone through um, how we can decide the number of clusters if we are given um, a large data set. So if all this sound abstract, let me show you how k-means work in um, using some actual data. Right, let me end this slideshow. 
And let me show my Jupyter notebook. So for this data set, um, I got this data set from Kaggle. And yeah, because Kaggle has um, loads of metadata that you can play with. And in this uh, metadata, what is um, inside the more customer CSV file is um, some data set on how customers um, spend their money. So I've titled this, um, this activity, finding insights from customer spending habits. So let us compare spending habits now compared to maybe 30, 30 years ago. 30 years ago, if I want to buy a cup of coffee, it might cost maybe um, 50p, but now a cup of coffee costs around two pounds to three pounds. So if I, yeah, so if I use, if I use um, what was spent last time, say 30 years ago, if someone is to spend one pound a day on coffee, it might seem that he's spending um, loads of money and he has high, high spending habits. However, if you uh, look at the power of money now because of inflation and, and others, we need two pounds 50 even to, to buy a cup of coffee. And that is why if we try to cluster um, like um, data points from, from previously and now, we need to um, like update the methodology because um, this changes over time. So without further ado, let me quickly show you um, the data set of this metadata. I, I won't so much talk about the Python code, but just I'll explain to you how, um, what, what's going on. So what I've done over here is I've loaded the, the, uh, the more customer CSV um, CSV file into my data. And I've created my um, X variables, which takes all rows and columns to onwards. So let me show you the data to have a better appreciation um, as to what's going on. So over here, we can see that there are 200 rows in the more customer CSV. Okay, we have the customer ID here. We have the uh, um, genre, which is male or female. We have their age, annual income, as well as spending score. Over here, I've created um, a variable X. So let me show you how that looks like. Okay. Let me only show you the top 10 X values. You can see that in X, I've retrieved the age, the annual income, as well as the spending score and put it into, into X because these are the columns that we are going to use to predict um, which clusters these different individuals should be in. Next. I'm going to do some feature scaling. As we discussed earlier, we need to um, scale our data so that they are in similar, they are, they are more comparable. So over here, I've done, um, they have used um, the Python library, uh, scalen.preprocessing, and I've imported standard scalar. And I've um, feed and transformed the columns X that I've created just now. So moving on, I calculated, uh, I've done some PCA. So like Rashid mentioned, PCA um, or principal component analysis narrows down the number of uh, columns that you have. In this case, I only have three columns, but imagine if you have a, a data set where you have um, 10 or, or 20 columns that, that have been provided, but which we can use to predict which clusters and, and individuals from. If we have so many clusters, at the end of the day, if you want to visualize the results, it is hard to visualize. And that is why we use PCA to um, find or, or essentially create new columns that 
explains the um, variation of the data well. In this case, I've used, uh, over here I've set 0 0.75. Uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll go through this very quickly. 0 0.75 is the explained variance measuring the proportion uh, to which a mathematical model accounts for the variation for a given data set. And a good value normally goes from 0 0.7 and above. Let me run this code. Okay. So this is taking a while. But yeah, again, when this happens, what, uh, what we get is a newly created columns or some newly created columns that we can use to do our analysis. Now, if I print the explain variance, which I created over here, what this means is that we can see two values over here, 0 0.44 and 0 0.33. So what this means is that I've created two new columns and these two new columns has an explain variance of, uh, of more than 0 0.75 because um, this is, because what happens behind is 0 0.44 plus 0 0.33 is around 77%, which is higher than 0 0.75. So what we have done is using the three columns, now we have created uh, two new columns for our, for our analysis. Now, I'm going to show you how the elbow method works. And for the elbow method, um, we need to calculate the WCSS. And if you remember just now, we need to set a K value from one to 10. Um, yeah, so because I, I use some Python code, um, it does a calculation for me. Um, yeah, so what's happening here, here is for each value um, in one to 10, I'm going to calculate WCSS and put it inside this list. Let me show you how the graph look when it's done. So using the elbow method, we can see that the point of inflection is around five or six. For this analysis, I'm just going to use with uh, use the number of classes five, but I think some may argue that six uh, could also work as well. All right, with, um, with the number of classes that I have, which is five, I then need, I, I will now proceed with um, the um, grouping of the different individuals. Over here, I set up my k-means model and I try to predict um, which cluster that they are in based on the XPCA that I've created just now. The code at the bottom merely uh, plots out the um, clustering values that I've created. And let me just run them and we will see how it looks like. Okay, so over here, I've created five different clusters. For the first one, orange, and in the top left, we can see that they have high annual income and they have low spending score. So if I'm to label them, I would probably say that these people are thrifty because they don't spend unnecessarily. If I look at the yellow cluster, they have high annual income and high spending score. If I'm to label this um, cluster or group, I would say that they um, like spending or, or love to splurge. Going on to um, the one, the purple one at the bottom right, you see they have low annual income and low spending score. So what this means is that the, this um, group of people, they don't spend unnecessarily. And if that's the case, I will label them as careful. Um, as seen over here, the purple group. The group over here, the bottom right, the red cluster, they have low annual income and high spending score. So this means that they, are, they love spending even though they don't earn too much. So I might label them as spendthrift. And for the blue cluster, I'll call them um, average customers because the annual income lies around in the middle of the, the sample we have selected. And they also have somewhat average spending score, except for a few of the um, points to, towards the 
uh, towards the to, towards both ends. Okay. One point to take note also is that over here there seems to be an overlap between the purple as well as the blue cluster. Do remember that this is because when we use our X to create the um, the uh, it, the uh, to calculate the, the columns, we also, yeah, let me just quickly scroll that up. When we use X, we also use H. So we have H, annual income, and spending score. However, in this chart, in this chart we only look at annual income as well as spending score. So because we, don't, we, don't, we didn't introduce the axis of H, we aren't able to visualize what's going on here. The code over here um, nearly just plots the different data points into three different axes, so we can clearly see what has happened if we introduce their age in as well. All right, this is um, taking a while to load. Okay, I think this is done. Let me scroll down a little bit. Okay. So after introducing the third axis, which is the which is the age, um, let me orientate this to what we have just now. So okay, the top left is orange, yellow. Okay. So again, we see that we have um, the sorry, let me scroll a bit down. We see we have the orange group again with high annual income, um, low spending score, let me orientate, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is thrifty, yellow splurge, red um, spendthrift, careful, and spendthrift, yeah. So if I try to turn this around a little bit to look at why there's an overlap here, we can see that actually this is this seems to be divided by age as well because for the purple, for the purple points, um, which we have indicated careful just now, we are from here. If we introduce the column of the axis of age, we can see that they generally are um, above the age of forty. And if we look at the blue cluster, they seem to have an age of less than uh, fifty or less. So over here, I've created some more um, age group values. Yeah, and that's how we create our classes. So if you um, if you own a, a shop in this shopping mall, or if you want to see how customer spending habits has changed, and if you, for example, um, want to set up your uh, marketing campaign, ideally what you are, the cluster that you want to go for would be those that have high annual income or even high spending score, which is to the right over here. Um, yeah, ideally we do not want to target this um this group of individuals. I mean, this this is debatable because they have low lower annual income, but they have really high spending score. So, um, if they do spend a bit more excessively. Their, finance, their personal financial situation might be in trouble. So yeah, again, we, need, we will need to dive deeper into other data to see what's really going on. But to wrap things up, this is how we um, cluster the different um, groups if we have a real life data set. And with that, I bring you to the end of uh, this presentation and I hope you guys have enjoyed yourselves. Mm -hmm.